tell you, without the Word of God, I would go insane over the last three months. <laughs> what to believe. What to believe. Right. But we know one sure thing, right? Right? One sure thing. And it's this. Again, you have come here to hear the good news. Okay. And it is this. <laughs> yeah! We need that. We need that. It doesn't seem like that, right? We live in a world of darkness. We need that. Christ is Lord. And He loves us. If you are in Him, He loves you immensely. And it's good news. This is the Gospel of Luke we're studying. Gospel. Uh, euangelion, which we pull evangelism from that Greek word. It, it's good news of Christ. And this world needs good news. I need to hear good news every day. And feel it, feel it. Lord, just pour yourself into me. I need to know it. I thank you for the songs this morning. I mean, just the words to be reinforced with Scripture constantly. Um, I hope you have a hunger for the Word, just to read it. To, it's just a delight to my ears to hear the same verses over and over many times. It's like, oh, I forgot about that verse. Oh, you mentioned one this morning. Be anxious about nothing in all things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feed it to me. Feed it to me. And we need this because we are in a dark world. Uh, and I just want to remind you of something, of Satan. Um, I've been doing a little study with Satan. It's like, oh, here we go. I know when I do that, I'm to expect some harassment. Usually that happens when I study his scheming and his ways. And <clears throat> but when I study God's Word, um, I want to take us up from Luke right now to God's divine perspective just to set things in our mind the way things are. That Satan... <clears throat> Satan's running this world. Okay? He's, he's running. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is uh, the one who has dominion over the earth. And there's contingencies to that. He doesn't have free reign. But... Back in Luke, we've seen Satan come to Jesus and tempt him. And at the very end, it says, he went, a, he went away for another opportune time. And so as we've gone through the book of Luke, there has been this attack on Christ all the way through. Whether it's demons rising up, that they're gathered in Israel. Uh, forces of Satan have come there to try to stop God's plan. And they can't contain them. They've tried to kill them a few times already. And Satan has even worked through Peter to tell Jesus he doesn't need to die. He, he doesn't... He, <laughs> He tries to take Jesus off course, and Jesus says, get, get thee behind me, Satan. I know you're using Peter here in this instance as, as an agent. But he wants to stop the Son of God at all costs. At all costs. And as Satan continues to stir chaos in God's work with darkness from that very time, from the beginning of in the, in the garden all the way through history. I have to stop and, and I just had this consolation because it frustrates me who he is and what he does against God's work. 
But we have this consolation that Satan is so frustrated with his work. I think about all that he's tried to do and all God continues to do and how frustrating that is for him. And I find that hilarious. We, we, have, to, we have to see this because I would think he would tire out after thousands of years working relentlessly against God, treading water for a foothold. And the biggest frustration of, in all of history is hilarious. That with Christ, Satan has gathered everything in Israel to stop him, to kill him, to arrest him, to stop his message, to stop him from completing his mission. And Satan accomplishes it. Right? He gets Christ on the cross. And he's ready to rejoice. Yeah! We've beat. We've taken the author of life and removed him from the world. And with that victory in hand, in a matter of three days... I can just picture all the forces of hell holding on to that stone of Jesus' tomb, right? And Christ brilliantly coming out. What? And so all that Satan tried to do and accomplish now was for nothing. And not only that, He's accomplished the saving of the world by killing the Savior. He's done God's work. I mean, it's one thing to be, to be defeated, but then on top of that, to do your enemy's work? Yes! So his victory was stolen. And Satan actually accomplished God's purpose in that act. And all those who opposed Christ accomplished God's purpose. So that is the ultimate of his frustration. Add on that now Christ's progeny. Those, those people who are followers now keep popping up in his world, harassing his forces with God's agape love, prayer, worship, witness, and proclamation of God's inspired word. Constantly. It's like whack-a-mole, right? <laughs> They're popping up everywhere. That's frustrating. I mean, his work has been damage control nonstop from the very beginning. And still, Satan continues on. But on top of that, he's losing so many of his minions to the gospel of Christ. I mean, his own people that he's controlling are being pulled out from under, under him. Those who were his, that he was, that he had possession of that were under his world system, under his control, are being stripped from him. Right out from under his nose. And that reminds me of back in Luke when Jesus said, I saw Satan and he's falling like light all over the sky where people are coming to Christ and being pulled out of bondage out of Satan's system and given life. And each one of those become a problem for Satan once again. It's like, oh, I have to deal with that one now. They were such a good servant of mine. Paul, he was my killer. He 
was destroying Christians for me. And now God takes them and pulls them out of my hand. And now it's writing half, half of the New Testament through him. I mean, you see the frustration. And now, here in the book of Luke, Jesus is surrounded by enemies, those in religious Jewish garb who hated Christ's authority, hated all that he was because he was a threat to their power, but Satan's behind them. They are agents working out Satan's plan. And Jesus called them the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He called them sons of their father, saying, you are the children of Satan. And he said, you're going off making converts, traveling miles and miles to make converts to make people sons of hell. That they'll be in a worse position than if they had never heard what you said. Jesus called them out. And so Satan, is he, Christ is Lord. He, so you've got sit, Satan, this is the world. You probably recognize it, right? There's Africa. Okay, so you got these millions of people out there, all these different nations, <clears throat> and Satan's moving pieces around, and they're nothing to them, to him. They're they're just useful tools. He doesn't care. He's a murderer. He's a he's a liar and deceiver. He's the deceiver of the nations. But he has these nations in control, and he's moving them around. And right now, during Jesus' time, he has the Jewish religion under his power. Satan does. It has become so apostate, so far from what God had intended in the Old Testament. We understand that, right? That we're talking about an apostate religion at that time full of hypocrisy, full of pride, full of lust, everything. <clears throat> and so Satan has made that little kingdom there in Israel to go against Jesus. But he also has other kingdoms. Oh, he's got Rome, which is the bigger kingdom right next to it, that, that controls Israel. But the thing is... <clears throat> All these factions that he's working are fighting each other as well. They all have wills of their own. Okay? It's not just Satan's will and God's will. Now we've got people and nations. And if we read Psalm 75 7, it says, It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. In other words, God is moving kings and rulers in the world. He makes empires rise. He makes empires fall. So as Satan brings up an empire and is trying to lead them, one of these other empires will come and destroy it. This very Jewish religion that is going against Christ will, in a matter of decades, be completely destroyed. And what was the year of that? 70 AD, Jerusalem will be destroyed. So another evil empire rises and destroys that empire that Satan has built. And so this continually goes on throughout all history. And these factions, um, I've heard the term hurt, trying to herd cats. Have you ever heard that before? can't herd cats, cats, right? You can't get them all working together. And that's what Satan is doing. He's got to be so frustrated 
with it all. Good. <laughs> Good. And the greatest news of it all. Satan, in the end, <clears throat> he wants to get the whole world working together. This is his plan. To set up a kingdom on this earth. That, let me remind you, in Isaiah 14, God is speaking to one of its agents, but actually speaking to Christ. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. That's Christ's name. He was son of the morning or son of the dawn, morning star. He was Lucifer, the head angel. <clears throat> but God says, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. This is his five I wills. You want to know what Satan is about? This is what he's about. I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I, I will be over all the other angels. I will raise, uh, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the northern mount. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. Can you understand that? Do you comprehend what, that's, what he's saying here? That he thinks he can be God. Replace God. And so he wants a kingdom on earth that is his and that worships him. And so he's working with all these nations in the world. China, North Korea, Iran, Soviet Union. We can look at it and say, these are secular nations, right? You, you want to know what it's like to be under that domination and control? Here in America, we have no idea. We don't understand what we have, right? That's a frustration right there. And what people in what Christians endure in the world in these places. And so Satan eventually wants to get the world as one working in that concerted effort. Where the people today would say, Yeah, we need global leadership. Get us all on one page. Somebody to save the day. We know what it look, what it would look like. And we know God has warned us of such a thing. And actually, that's going to be brought in here when I get to the actual message, to the Word. <clears throat> but I want us to have that big picture. And Satan will have his time. He will have his time at the end of this age in the tribulation to set up his kingdom. But it's going to be even more frustrating for him. <laughs> More and more frustrating. Not only that, he's going to be chained for a thousand years after Christ returns. Or when Christ returns, he's going to chain Satan for a thousand years. And then he's going to cast his person into hell. The lake of fire where God has determined him to go. That's refreshing. I just had to get that off my, off my chest <laughs> and give the good news that Christ has overcome. He will overcome and God wins in the end. He's winning all the time. No matter how Satan is trying to stop the Word of God and make it as dark as possible in this world, the little lights keep shining brighter and brighter. I've seen such a resurgence in great teaching online that I'd never seen before. 
in these days? Because it is refining those who are His. It truly is. So, as we come down from that big view, <laughs> down to the year of 30 AD, to the time of Christ here, <clears throat> Jesus had His triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They wanted to catapult him forward as king. He allowed them to go through the emotions. And the Pharisees are saying, stop the people from saying that you are the blessed one from God, that you are the Messiah. Jesus said, nope. I'm going to let them speak. They have to speak. Because I'm, I'm the one. And so he goes in, cleans out the temple, gets rid of the corruption that's been done in religion, and starts teaching in his house, in the temple. And the Pharisees, the leaders, they're angry because they think this is their house. This is their people. This is their religion. This is their way of life. And so they are after Christ. They want to get him arrested. They want to get him killed. And we've already seen where they're just wandering through the temple, listening to him teach, and scheming. Scheming. Satan's behind, in the shadows, giving them ideas. They're scheming. What can we do to Jesus? We've got to entrap him with his words. And so they tried to entrap him the first time with, by whose authority are you doing all these things? Who do you think you are? Say it. They want him to blaspheme God and say that he is actually... They want him to say it in front of thousands of people who he is. But they're fear fearful of the crowd. That's, that's the great thing here. They're afraid of this crowd. And so Jesus confounds them with a counter question of, of putting it back to them. It's a catch-22 where um, they can't answer his question. He's like, I'm not going to answer you unless you answer me. And so they go back in their huddle and they're like, what can we do? What can we do? We've got to do something. <clears throat> and then Jesus gives the, the parable of the tenants and pretty much tells them the history of the Jews killing the prophets and now God has sent the Son. And they're going to kill him. And what should God do? So they're like, oh, we've got to stop him. We've got to stop him. Now they realize they can get him to blaspheme the state, the powers to be, the earthly rulers, Rome. And so, Turn with me to Luke 20. We're finally there. <laughs> so verse, verse 19. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. So keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right. And that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, he saw through their duplicity, or their hypocrisy, or does somebody have something different there? Craftiness. Tri okay, there you go. Trickery, craftiness. These are words of Satan, correct? 
<clears throat> Show me a denarius whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. Now, they all hated Jesus. <clears throat> And talking about Satan's factions working together at times to fulfill his, Satan's purpose, they will go after what is good and join forces. We see that in America all the time. Different factions getting together to fight God and his work. <clears throat> in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, it gives the same account of Luke. And Mark does the same. But he says the Herodians are there as well. Now, on a, on a vast scale of these different leaders, you've got the Herodians here, you've got the priests on this end of the spectrum, and then you've got the Pharisees, and the scribes, Sadducees, whoops, not... We didn't get, you know what I mean. <laughs> Not to be sloppy. <clears throat> but here, the priests are those who teach, teach the word. Um, you've got the scribes that interpret the word. And so these are very religious people. I mean, they, they, they have the word of God. They're somewhat using it, but to their own ends. We see that all the time. Um, then you've got the Pharisees who are not quite on that spectrum, but they're pretty... These, these are the very devout, holy men who walk around and they are the religious police to make sure everybody is abiding by the laws that the Word of God... gives as well as their own laws that they built on top of God's law and made this whole system. So they're the Pharisees. Then you got the Sadducees who are on the end of the religious spectrum, but they are there to work more with the world around them, with Rome and uh, with Herod's people. Herod is the bad king over Israel at this time. Um, he's not Jewish. Jewish people hate him. He's just ruthless. But Rome put him in charge. So you've got his state people hanging around with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They all hate each other. Each one of these factions, um, the priests and the Pharisees hate the Sadducees. The Sadducees hate the Rhodians. The Rhodians hate all of them. But we're seeing them all work together now to stop Christ. Christ is uniting them all because they see Jesus as the threat to their kingdom, to their power. And so the Herodians are thrown into this mix now and really they're behind this <clears throat> and they need to make Jesus be perceived as anti-Rome and they know the Messiah is a role of kingship of God's set king that he's placing in this world to rule over Israel and everything all peoples But they had to have him arrested by Rome because they had no power. 
They had been stripped of power, the power for capital punishment. They could not do it themselves. So they had to get Rome involved. That's why Pontius Pilate was pulled into this whole thing. He's like, why should I settle your disputes? But they're trying to get Jesus killed via capital punishment. But the thing is, they feared the people. They feared they would lose the people's trust, respect, so they can't just go out and kill him as well. Because the people will revolt. And they needed the people around. They needed all these sheep, these lackeys, that they had no care for any of the people. The religious leader, leaders, they didn't care. They abused and used the Jewish people. They had contempt for them. They thought of them as lower. They were all about self pleasing we, We've learned that through the book of Luke. That, that has been their mindset. But if they could just get Jesus arrested, they could dash the people's hope, and they wanted to get him to the governor. That's what it states. And so, masquerading as truth seekers, you can picture these, they've taken off their garb, if they had garb, and they're going to go get close to Jesus and try to flatter him. Okay? They're, they're using words here <clears throat> by number one, addressing him as teacher, rabbi. Oh, sweet teacher. Oh, oh. <laughs> teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right. Okay, none of the Pharisees, no one has said this to him yet. And that you do not show partiality, you don't, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. In other words, you don't say something different to this group and then change it and say something different to this group, you know, speaking to the audience. It's just like, no, I'm speaking the truth to you, speak the truth to you, speak the truth to you. It's the same, it's always true. So they're using it as flattery. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. This is the only truth that they've sp spoke so far. Spoken. Have spoken. <clears throat> but they're flattering him, thinking that he will fall for their same setup for their own pride. Because they're flattered all the time. And they love it. <laughs> you know how, how fake and shallow it is to hear it. Um, so they're trying to use this as a way to influence his thinking of getting close to him to say, to answer a question. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they pose this question to him, <clears throat> which, if he answers either direction, will catch him in, in a bad, bad position. Because if he says, yes, we have to pay taxes to Caesar, he is, he is, <clears throat> Words slip away sometimes. But he's, <laughs> he's saying, okay, we need to accept Rome and uh, their, their foot on us, their, their domination over us. We need to accept that. And he's complicit with the enemy. If he says no... Then he is a rebel. He is going against Rome itself, against Caesar himself. So it's a no, no win. No win. No matter how he answers. 
Yes or no? They know they can trap him with this question. But I like it. He saw through their duplicity and said to them that he saw through their two-facedness, their hypocrisy. That's we get that word hypocrisy from the acting word in Greek of putting on different masks. Okay, so they're pretending to be one person. He, he knows. He knows who they are. He knows their hearts. Matthew says, but Jesus knowing their evil intent. Let's just get down to it. Their evil intent. Intent. He knew it. But he said, show me a denarius. And that's a coin. Coin from Rome. And imprinted on the coin is the head of Caesar. And just to give you a little bit of background on Caesar, we all know Julius Caesar, right? He was the one that took power in... Uh, I had it written down here. I'm trying to wrap it. Um, before Christ. I it anyway, unimportant. Um, Caesar Augustus, or Julius Caesar, he was killed in the great play by Shakespeare, right? At Tubrote. He died, but his son Octavian took over. And Octavian was also known as Augustus. But Julius Caesar considered himself divine. He considered himself God. Okay? He had Satan's complex. He thinks he's God, even though he died. But... His son, Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus, took on the role then, I'm the son of God. And it was imprinted on the coin, son of the God. And so, Caesar Augustus was Caesar at this time, and Jesus now, which is brilliant, he says, give me a coin. This is brilliant. Give me a coin. And they bring him a denarius, which is a day's wage. And it's the coin they use to pay Rome, Rome's tax. But he said, whose who's, who's image and inscription are, are on it? Okay. And so they reply, Caesar's. They, it's Caesar, right? They give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I mean, this is brilliant. I mean, it's God speaking. He's like, hey, whatever Caesar's, give it to him. But what you owe God, give it to them. Give it to him. And really, this is an invitation to them. Hey, you need to give to God what you owe him. And it's actually obedience to me, to Christ. This is another invitation, His grace and mercy extended. He's like, you can give temporal things all day long to that temporal king, but give to God what is His. And for me, these words are, it helps clear up a lot of things for me, for each one of us struggling in this world between the earthly and the heavenly, right? Sometimes, like, what, what should I do here? I don't... What's that division? What's that fine line between what God demands and what the world's, world demands? Jesus is saying, look, there's two different kingdoms here. You're in one. You're not of it. If you're mine... You're part of a different kingdom, God's kingdom. And so we each are stuck here in this kingdom for a while, but we are here to represent God's kingdom. And all that is owed to Him. So, 
As we learned in Romans chapter 13, when we studied it, there is obligations that we as Christians are to hold on to. Um, government has been established by God. It has been His protector of freedom in the world through all history. Um, Acts 17, it says that God from one man, speaking of Noah, um, I do want to read this. Acts 17, 24, Paul is writing. He said, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temple built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed it, anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So through Noah, if you remember the Tower of Babel, all the people coming together to show that they were united and all how great they were, they built the Tower to Heaven. That's what happens if you leave man alone for a long time. They declare themselves God and say, we're in charge. And God said, hey, we've got to go down and frustrate this. There will be no freedom in the world because they're just going to suppress everybody's thoughts. And so God goes down, Genesis 11, if you want to go back and look at that. God goes down, frustrates the nations, gives them all different languages, and sends them out of the world. Disperses them. It's for a purpose. And Paul is explaining it here of saying, look, God has made all these nations, and they should inhabit the whole earth and he, and he marked out their appointed times and histories in the boundaries of their land. So as nations rise, we see the balance of power all through history shift and change. And, and God's using these nations to fulfill his tasks. Satan's a bystander trying to work his will and God frustrated, fr frustrates us because Romans 8, all things work together for the good of those who love Christ. What a great what a great verse. Mm -hmm. It's like all things are working for the good of God and those who love Him frustrate Satan to no end. And God is moving and shifting and changing. And He places these nations in the world. Back to the verse. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. It's so that there is places of pockets of freedom in this world that we can worship. Proclaim the message. I mean, it still goes on in China. Even though it's clamped down as an outright to go out and worship the true God and not a prefabricated church that submits to communist China. Okay, The real... Ch Even though Satan has made it a dark place, God's light is still there. The church is still strong in China. Underground. But in order to keep peoples free, we have national sovereignty. Where they can, each nation can protect its people through... Romans 13, that it bears a sword. Um, we have what timing for this message. I'm, I'll probably speak more on Wednesday because um, I'll put it online on Facebook, um, on our site. Because Romans 13 tells us what a nation is for. Its role is to protect the good, promote the good of the people. And we're talking about God's good. Not what they think is good. God's good. And to bear the sword. To use the sword to protect the people. We have the military and police for that purpose. Right? 
We thank God for a military and police to keep law and order. God is a God of law and order. He's not a God of chaos. Satan's a God of chaos. There's a message in that right there. But Paul finishes off Romans 13 of saying, what is we as Christians responsible for? He's like, you are to be the utmost citizens, model citizens, obeying every law. You are to pay your taxes. That's what Jesus said, right? Give to Caesar what's Caesar. If it's an honor due to them, give them honor and respect. Give respect to them. If something's due to the system, world system, give it. But what God, what's His, you give to Him. Uh, Romans 12. In speaking to that, as followers of Christ, how do we give to God what is His? Uh, he says, therefore, Romans 12, verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, not a dead one. Not to give yourself in death. You, it can lead to that. But he's saying a living sacrifice where you're continually giving to God. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. To, to deny yourself picking up your cross and following Him is what that means. Right? Being Christ's disciple. Giving your body over to Him. And not only that, your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. This is exactly what I was going to talk about this last Wednesday. Never got to it, but I will be this Wednesday in the next question of Jesus. Do not conform to the pattern, to the rut of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Taking in God's word. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We all owe Christ. We all owe God everything. We are to give Him all. All. So the result was, they didn't get what they came for. They couldn't catch Jesus in this trap. They were unable to trap him. What he said right there in public, they were astonished by his answer and left in silence. And Satan sat in the background, seething. That's right. <laughs> You're not going to win, Satan. So thus ends our civics course brought to you straight from our Lord. <laughs> but I will be talking about that more. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Christ, for all you have done for us, laying down your life, suffering. I hear people asking, if only God would send one, someone that understands our suffering. Well, He has. And Lord, He sent us Jesus who suffered and hung on the cross to take upon Himself all that was meant for each one of us. We deserve hell. We deserve the justice of God. We deserve the hammer of judgment. And yet, Christ stood in the way. And believing that, that Jesus is the one, the sinless Lamb, that would take our place as a substitute, 
and remove all of our sin, all of our unrighteousness, take it away forever. I thank you, Lord, for that. And then you give the gift of life, the gift of righteousness, the gift of eternal life, the gift of understanding who you are, the closest to speak to you and you hear our voice. What a great privilege and honor we have, Lord, to know you. Father, may this fill us and drive us and compel us to let other people know about Christ. That He is the answer in this dark, dark, dark world. That He is the light, the light, the light that shines in us. And He is the life. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.